spend a few minutes talking about what's going on in Portland, uh, just in terms of like, you know, the presence of these fascist rallies. Uh, what, well, I mean, basically, but I had some maybe a little bit more specifics, but just generally give us a sense of, you know, what's actually going on in the ground. Like, why is Portland such a focal point for this stuff and what's going on? Uh, it's why is a really interesting question. So I'll start with what's going on because it's sort of simpler to explain. But for the past, you know, year and a half or so since Trump uh, took office, we've had a escalating series of uh, basically uh brown shirt style paramilitary incursions into the city by out of uh, out of town groups um uh, one of which uh sort of the key uh group being patriot prayer which is really just a guy named joey gibson uh matthew who... weiss <coughs> oh, no, I'm sorry, excuse, <laughs> excuse me. me yeah no sorry my mistake yeah. that's all right right uh who, who is a youtuber and man and start a Facebook page and managed to get a bunch of uh, you know Trump supporters to go to his uh, quote unquote free speech rallies um, <laughs> in Portland, which he uh, explicitly declared war on. Uh, he, he paints it as like a uh, a den of a sin and uh, uh, you know intolerable uh, SJW ness um, right. and riddled with antifa terrorists. So for the past year and a half, every month or so, sometimes twice a month, he and his crew have rolled in and basically um, provoked a uh, response from different anti-fascist groups in town. So uh, what started is, um, you know, sort of irregular kind of uh, taunts and standoffs turned into sort of you could set your watch by the street fights and uh earlier this month uh there was a uh, rally that um you know sometimes they bring in a lot of out-of-towners mm -hmm. uh, proud boys three percenters all kinds of different groups have sort of hooked up and it becomes like uh, a big event for the alt-right uh for the scrappy alt-right to come to portland and, and basically fight with antifa uh and so earlier this month uh they announced uh basically their intention to bring guns now when people started to freak out about that they said well it's not a big deal because we've been bringing guns the whole time uh concealed weapons and that we're was already okay. doing it <laughs> yeah already happened um so you know there's a lot of media attention uh the the <clears throat> i wrote a story about the uh for the daily beast about this last rally um and people can go find it there if they search my name and Daily Beast. But long story short, uh, the we what we learned was that the police um, were really protecting this group in a way that the anti-fascists were uh, had been saying for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, even mm -hmm. reporters like myself, who covered it closely, uh, thought that you know they might be exaggerating a little bit, uh, but. They, what happened was the police uh, lined up and, and charged the counter protesters. Right. They didn't even search the people who said they were bringing weapons, uh, w which uh, was quite shocking. Uh, but they did fire flashbangs and break up the counter demonstration, therefore guaranteeing that the only freedom of speech that uh, was protected that day was the freedom to support the president. Um, it, and then the chief of police went on a local conservative talk radio show and basically bragged about beating up uh, the protesters and uh, bragged about the fact that she uh, didn't consult the mayor or any other civilian authorities when she planned these kind of things. And now everybody's sort of uh, kind of horrified and, and wondering, uh, you know, one who's in charge <laughs> of... Uh, the police rank and file, where are their sympathies, and, um, you know, when is this going to stop? And they almost killed somebody, right? Like, well, I saw the, the photos time, on Twitter, they were gnarly. The last, uh, so not this most recent rally, but the time before last, uh, the, uh, the Proud Boys uh, and the right-wing groups sent several people to the hospital, uh, including with a skull fracture, so, yeah, they almost killed somebody that time. This time, the police 
uh, very nearly could have killed someone because they were firing these uh, crowd control weapons uh, at people. And one uh, seemed to be aimed squarely at uh, a guy's head and it pierced this helmet he was wearing and still wounded him pretty severely. So if he hadn't been wearing a helmet, yeah, it could have killed him. But So I have two different questions and one is one is more you know strategic and critical and then the other is maybe more to the point if that makes or 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 way more dangerous and i think is probably true so one you know that there there was i mean this is the type of thing that is important i think to deal with it can be used to distract from the bigger picture and the sort of bigger reality you just outlined but there was this story of you know, Antifa basically attacking a guy who had an American flag and, uh, you know, he was actually there to be in solidarity with the anti-fascists and was like a Bernie supporter, but, you know, was doing a sort of, you know, liberal style, hey, like this fa- this flag doesn't represent bigotry. And he was actually attacked by a couple of people that associate with Antifa. Um, and, you know, again, part of it is like this isn't a centralized organization. And it's a, you know, it's sort of a broad sentiment and mesh works. And most of the work they do, I still think is incredibly important. And I also just support because this is just the situation we're in and the lines are already drawn, right? But I do wonder, is there, is there potential value in like, you know, this other sort of like, Not the kind of whiny, like, oh, well, Antifa, you know, engages physically, so they're just as bad. These sort of ridiculous, wuss bag, ahistorical false equivalencies. But the more broad, just the more sort of strategic notion that, like, you know, these groups in a much more violent and dangerous way are following the Ben Shapiro and Milo model, which is they're going to places to intentionally create conflict, essentially. And when they get a response, that's how they drive a narrative. And if they were just sort of blown off or ignored, there is less oxygen. And, you know, we've got other and better things to do. That's the strategic question I have. And then I want to get back to a specific question about what's actually going on with the police departments there. But that well, this this yeah. sort of answers the why this sort of answers the, the why uh, in a sense, because uh, I mean, they keep coming here because they no, they will get a reaction. Right. 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 So, uh, look, this is this is really, I'm not sure I have the answers. I mean, among the other things that happened, I mean, I, I'm aware of the story that you're talking about. Uh, you know, in the story that I reported, there was uh, uh, an account of some fights that I witnessed where uh, people from the right wing side were, were basically splitting off from the main march where all the police were and assaulting random people yep. of color in the streets yep. of the city. And the yep. police were nowhere to be seen. Yep. Um, which sort of bolsters the the argument that, um, y- you know, uh, if the police aren't going to protect people, somebody should. Yep. Uh, mm-hmm. But at the same time, uh, like we are talking about vigilantism here. And uh, there's not a lot of discipline in these groups or training or any of the things that you would hope to see from, uh, you know, somebody that's deigning to uh, protect the the public. So uh, that is that is a problem. Now, I'm not sure what's worse. I mean, you know, when these rallies started, they were marching down like the main immigrant street in the city with Trump flags, which is kind of terrorizing. Yep. I mean, it's it, absolutely it, terrorizing. And, yes. Yes. And, uh, you know, uh, I'm not sure that ig- ignoring, uh, the, these folks is viable. I mean, ideally, I think what we'd want is, um, you know, a, a, uh, sort of local, uh, law enforcement, uh, response that recognized, uh, what was actually going on. And I'm not sure where the uh, chief of police and, and the city hall are getting their information. Um, I presume it's from uh, sources that uh, are portraying the Antifa groups as more dangerous. Uh, you know, the FBI uh, national conference this year was all about left-wing violence. And at the same time, at the federal level, all of the, uh, pretty much all of the, uh, you know, agents that were devoted to tracking white rape what right-wing extremism have been reassigned or sidelined. Anyway, it's not their time to shine, right? Right. right. Uh, 
So there's uh, there's probably a bit of a bias in, in the information that, that they're getting. And, you know, I'd, I'd hope to see uh, a little more uh, local uh, control over uh, how the police respond to these things. Because if you're, if you're carrying weapons across state lines for the express purpose of inciting a riot, I mean, that's not protected speech i'm sorry and no, even groups of course not. even groups like the uh the aclu that have uh you know been really uh consistent in their message about uh you know protecting rights to march uh, regardless of content have come around to saying well if you're br- if you're bringing weapons and talking about your intention to pick fights then uh you know we can't defend that uh, but the city, for some reason, I think they're afraid of getting sued, uh, has taken a different view. So, you know, I think there is a, a, a bit of a, a lack of leadership. Um, you can't, I mean, you can't have giant mob confrontations in the streets uh, without people getting hurt. And, I mean, it is the, it is the, uh, the city and the state which... Uh, are allowing that to happen by their lack of action and their their fear of ups- basically getting sued by right wingers. My final question uh, on that would be, and I think that that yes, that makes sense in terms of the state and the may, and the mayor's office, right? Because they also don't have. It also shows they don't have full control over their own police. Well, that was the thing that I wanted to get to because I I think like okay, there was a story recently of a guy he had to resign, I believe, but he was a, some type of uh, you know a relative, you know, had a leadership position for a police department in Louisiana. It was revealed that he was a proud boy. There's been a lot of reports, both documented when these sorts of things are being measured, as well as anecdotal of uh, far-right groups, you know, going into the military, going into police. And let me just put a few more other things on the table. And I want to be really clear that I'm not saying that this is a plan, that there is a conspiracy or any of this sort of thing. But I do want people to be a little aware of how these things work. In places where there have been far-right, right-wing governments that have committed atrocities or even political parties, right, there's usually paramilitaries and gangs where that activity is sort of informally outsourced to. So even like in Indonesia yes. in the 60s when you're, they were murdering literally hundreds of thousands of people on the left, a lot of the people that actually commit, the, and the orders and the encouragement are all from the government and the military, no question. But it's actually gangs and paramilitaries doing a lot of the actual, you know, the, the murdering. Um, the same dynamic in Serbia and Bosnia, same dynamic in Burundi, same, like anywhere you look. And my question does start to become, and this is why I say it's on the opposite end. Like I have a critique of, of Antifa in some ways, but on the flip side, okay, the cops have a bias there. And it's clearly for these, power, these far right groups. You have a presidency that we can even, we don't even have to get, we all know what they are in terms of their white nationalism, but specifically they've had the FBI and other organizations specifically pull back on monitoring right-wing terrorism. And then we have this whole whole ecosystem, which yes, a lot of it's still pretty online and goofy, but some of it is real serious and it's hurting people and there's already a context for it, um, you know, in terms of the militia movement and everything else. And you start to say, like, how much are police departments compromised by the presence of these groups? And are we, and I say this again, unconsciously, like organically, seeing that full emergence of like, okay, authoritarian far-right government and political party, street-based gangs that back that agenda, and then an intermediary of law enforcement with its own ideological extremism plus directives from the top and they could be you know the same guy who's posting about white genocide on 4chan could then go throw his uniform on i mean that certainly would track with all sorts of examples we see on a daily basis of police departments across this country well that's exactly the concern and you summarized it very well i mean this is this is what keeps me up at night and that you know i can't believe i forgot to mention that the uh the the most popular t-shirt on the uh on the right wing side at this last rally in Portland um, was uh, Pinochet did nothing wrong on the front. And then on the back, right. a picture of a helicopter 
with little stick men tumbling out and little Anifa flags on their where their heads were. Right. So, right. You know, they're being pretty clear about their intention. Now, I don't know that they could coordinate that themselves, but I think what we're talking about is sort of an alignment of interests. Cops like to punch hippies. Yep. They do it reflexively. Uh, you know, in, 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 in this area, they've been pretty explicit about it. Uh, one lieutenant even was quoted in an uh, internal uh, review uh, saying that the right-wing uh, marchers seemed a lot more mainstream than the counter-protesters. Uh, we're talking about a police force that, like in many cities, resides mostly outside of the city and commutes in, mm -hmm. so doesn't have much of a connection to the communities that they're policing, uh, apart from, you know, patrolling around and, and doing their, their work, uh, such as it is. And, you know, I think that their, their tendencies, I mean, uh, have, have been revealed. And if I were in any sort of elected office, uh, I would be very, uh, urgently conducting reviews do we have Proud Boys on the force? I mean, I don't know about that case in Louisiana, but we had one uh, in this area as well, where a uh, female uh, sheriff's deputy was uh, photographed online hawking Proud Boys merchandise. <laughs> right. Right. And right. and watching their conduct at these kind of rallies, uh, it it's it's very troubling. It's very troubling. I mean, there I've I've. I've been tracking these things for a year, and I've seen people commit felony assault in public multiple times, get arrested, and then get released the next day. And that leads me to go, what what's going on here? Yep. Uh, they don't. These people are known nuisances, uh, public safety threats. Uh, they're threatening violence repeatedly. They do this again and again, and they seem untouchable. So so what's happening? And I it it, it baffles me that. No one from City Hall to the Attorney General to the Governor's office to the you know to federal agencies no no law enforcement agency in the region seems to be able to answer uh, why this continues. Well, I think people on a very basic civic level have their marching orders in Oregon specifically in this case, which is you got to start calling these offices and say, "Excuse me, why is you know?" right-wing violence allowed to run rampant over you know a city and and for and you know have open conflict on the streets and then of course if you're also saying and i entirely believe you're reporting you're also just talking about the random targeting and assaulting of people of color across the, the city uh you know this is and and you know in all those areas and not that this should matter but let's be real it does you have Democrats holding all of those offices. Yes. So, you know, we, you know, you're not talking about trying to get a Republican to hold their base accountable. You're talking about Democrats, you know, essentially needing to protect their base from literally from the Republican base. Uh, Corey Pine, it's always a pleasure. Uh, I recommend that everybody check out the News From Nowhere podcast on Patreon. It's incredibly smart, sort of a deeper, fresh air with a left focus. And uh, Corey's a regular on Michael Brooks' show. I'm a regular on News From Nowhere. Live, Work, 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 Die is going to be one of the key books for understanding Silicon Valley economy and culture and how it's hitting all of us. Corey, always appreciate your time, brother. Thanks, Michael. Fun as usual. And uh, the book just launched in the UK and is about to go in Australia, too. So your listeners internationally should keep an eye out for it. Oh, wow. Congratulations. <laughs> wow. Any trips you're planning recently, Corey? No, no. I'm, I'm, <laughs> no I'm we, we, Corey and I have literally gotten on the phone at times and just been like, yeah, that was a good segment you guys did. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed it. Because there's... Not much enjoyment ahead. Um, Mazel tov, Corey. And thank you, by the way, for becoming a patron of the Antifada. It means a lot to me. I patronize all of your shows. Oh, literary. Right, right. Hey, yeah. What a mensch. What a mensch. We were, we were, Corey and I were first days on each other's, and I'm glad to see it growing. Corey, thanks, brother. Talk to you soon. Thank y'all. Take care.